four. Good evening and welcome to the Midland Board of Education's regularly scheduled meeting for February 13th, 2012. Uh, Madam Secretary, would you call roll, please? Sure. President Malt. Here. Vice President Wasserman. Here. Secretary Baker. Here. Treasurer Oli. Here. Member Branstad. Here. Member Gordon. And Member Kaminsky. Here. Thank you. We have a quorum, and thank you. Um, we don't have a very long consent agenda this evening, 2.1 to 2.3. Um, 2.1 is the meeting minutes from January. 2.2 is the staff uh, members have announced their resignations. And 2.3 is the law firm bills for, uh, appears the month of January. So anybody have any questions about those? I move approval, consent items 2.1 through 2.3. Support. Moved by Mr. Oli, supported by Mr. Wasserman. Any questions or comments? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. I know we have someone in the audience that wants to make a presentation to the board, so Betty, if you'd join us. Green, that must be it. <laughs> My name is Betty Chenoweth. I live at 4403 Dykeman Road in Midland. I have two children who are graduates of the Midland school system uh, 25, 30 years ago <laughs> is when they got out. <clears throat> and I have tonight here a letter from Mr. Ellinger. This is from the American Association of University Women, Midland Branch. Dear Mr. Ellinger, sexual harassment in the school setting for students in grades 7 through 12 is significantly more prevalent than previously believed. This serious problem was brought to light by research in 2011 by the American Association of University Women. A report of the research entitled Crossing the Line, Sexual Harassment at School documents information provided by nearly 2,000 students from across the nation about their experiences with sexual harassment. In some cases, the student was the recipient of the behavior. In other cases, the student was uh, the perpetrator. It's worth noting that nearly one-third, or 29%, of the students who experienced sexual harassment also identified themselves as harassers. This research is especially important because only one half of the students included in the survey reported the incident of sexual harassment. Why hasn't such behavior been more widely discussed and addressed as a problem in schools? One reason is that many of the students who admitted sexually harassing others characterized the incidents as no big deal or explained them as an attempt to be funny. When the results of harassing behavior leaves a student unable to sleep, reluctant to attend school, or to take different routes to and from class or school, how is it being used? Excuse me. Has serious negative consequences are already evidenced when the school student displays this behavior. We are aware that Midland Public Schools have a policy on sexual harassment. How is it being used? Have you identified a new Title IX coordinator? There is help. Crossing the line includes a section on preventing sexual harassment in schools with numerous suggestions for student, community, and school actions. While we are providing you with two copies of this report, it is also available online at www.aauw.org forward slash research. AAUW Midland Branch urges you to take a close look at sexual harassment in your schools and redouble efforts to combat it. And this letter is signed by me, Betty Chenoweth, a co-president of Midland AAUW, and Jane Worth, the other co-president. And so I have two copies for Mr. Ellinger and for your use. Thank you, Pat. Okay. Thank you, Betty. Is there anyone else in the uh, audience that would like to address the board at this time? 
seeing nobody else uh, coming forward, and again, thank you, Betty, and we'll move on uh, in our agenda. We'll move to Mr. Ellinger's superintendent's report. I will uh, attempt to make this as brief as I can, but it's been a couple of meetings since I've kind of filled you in, and I want to end with some detailed um, uh, information to draw our board and our community's attention to a bill that we think is going to be voted on in the uh, State House of Representatives perhaps as early as this week. So I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, this coming Wednesday, MPS has taken a group of 23 individuals to visit a new tech program in Pickney Public Schools. This includes the entire curriculum division, high school principals, and four staff from each high school building. Dave Diesek, Mr. Joe Asiala from MyTech Plus, and myself. We will spend the entire day visiting with, asking questions of, and researching the new tech concept and staff at Pickney. The cost of the trip is being picked up um, by MyTech Plus, and we appreciate their support as we continue to investigate programming in this area. On February 7th, Dr. Allison and myself had lunch with a representative of the Dow Chemical Company's Governmental Affairs Division, who is actively soliciting educators' input on educational curricula that the company is interested in developing. The company has offered summer training opportunities to MPS teachers, along with teachers across the country, and is actively looking to create educational partnerships with public schools. So we look forward to our continued conversations in this area. And this is something that uh, Mr. Liveris himself has made a priority for Dow Chemical. The district has completed our kindergarten orientation meetings at each site this past month. Several buildings have reported very high turnout. Some parents are clearly shopping MPS to determine which building they might choose under our current internal schools of choice practice. The district may want to consider establishing some controls on future internal schools of choice as we now have two buildings with rising numbers of kindergarten sections. Last Friday, February 10th, 2012, we hosted our district parent involvement committee meeting. The topic presented by Dr. Ellison, Mr. Bob Cooper, and myself was K-12 district testing and assessment why we do it, when we do it, and how we, the state and colleges, use the collected data. Once again, the topic was very well received by the district's parent group, and the curriculum division presented information in a timely, informative, and very understandable fashion that was appreciated by the parents in attendance. I've attended in the past month MyTech Plus, Midland Tomorrow, Chamber of Commerce, and Mid-Michigan Medical Center board meetings and subcommittee meetings this past month representing the voice of MPS um, on each community group. I also had the opportunity, frankly, and really the privilege um, uh, uh, back the very first part of the month to attend the Michigan Association of School Administrators uh, Winter Conference in Detroit um, the first three days in February. Uh, I was there along with most superintendents in the state of Michigan, and speakers addressing the conference included Dr. Tim Quinn, founding director of the Broad Superintendents Academy, State Superintendent of Schools, Mr. Mike Flanagan, as well as a number of state and national instructional technology experts, including many representative of the Apple Corporation. On January the 27th, I attended the 2011-2012 Michigan Department of Education Accountability Tour, important updates on accountability topics by the Michigan Department of Education's Bureau of Assessment and Accountability. Uh, this was a very interesting day I spent down in Ingham County because from that um, it's very clear that I think our future funding and the governor um, showed us evidence of this in his budget address last Thursday is going to be tied to district student growth in part um, even at the building level and even at the teacher level and we're aware of that. Um, I think all our individual teachers are as well. So we got an inside look on what that would mean and I passed that information on to Mr. Cooper and to Dr. Ellison. Um, upon my return. The district has conducted first-line interviews for our district technology director, which is a management, not an administrative position, and we're in the process of conducting reference checks on finalists to determine if a best fit exists to move on and make an offer or to consider reposting of the position. Just an update on teacher negotiations. Uh, both the board and the Midland City Education Association have filed their final fact-finding briefs with the fact finder. We're hopeful to hear determination by early to mid-March with the fact finders report. Uh, the Midland Public Schools Curriculum Division has been very busy this past month, planning for the 21st Century Learning Community Panel, 
planning two full days of PD for district school improvement plans, work that's done in combination with the Great Lakes Bay Educational Consortium, and working with the International Baccalaureate Study Committee examining potential expansion of our IB programming options, and with providing support for principals and their curriculum and orientation meetings for next year's incoming students. So they've been a very busy group, and I know a number of them are watching uh, tonight on, on TV. On January 26th, Midland Public Schools received the second in our payments um, to uh, fund $680,000 of support for the International Baccalaureate Program. Uh, on that date, we received $340,000 from the Dow Chemical Company Foundation. We would like to publicly thank this very generous MPS partner for their support for this globally recognized, challenging, comprehensive pre-university program available to Midland Public School students. Thank you to Dow Chemical Companies Foundation. And the last thing I want to report on, I think I sent an email out to the uh, entire board earlier today, has to do with the uh, on-capping or the controlling of future expansion in the state of Michigan of the cyber school bill. One look at the newly developed state education dashboard and you'll see that cyber schools in Michigan and across the country aren't making the grade. Not only are, are cyber schools underperforming the state average in academic growth, math proficiency, and ACT college readiness, only 9.1% of the students at the Michigan Virtual Charity Academy, for example, are proficient on the Michigan Merit Exam. Nationally, only a hair over 27% of online schools managed by educational management companies um, made AYP last year across the country. That's substantially lower than traditional brick and mortar schools. Our board has heard me talk about the importance of um, expanding and providing more options for our students and our parents' um, kids uh, with the use of online technology, but taking the cap off cyber schools is something that ought to have the attention of all of us. The proposed um, Senate bill, which goes to the House for potential action maybe in the next day or two, provides no restriction on out-of-state cyber school companies for making huge profits from the state school aid tax dollars. Cyber schools receive the same amount per student as other charter schools, but do not build or operate buildings, they have no student transportation costs, and they have a higher student-to-teacher ratio than traditional schools, some as high as 270 students to one instructor. When cyber schools were created in Michigan, the intent was for the Michigan Department of Education to issue a report on the progress made after the first two years of operation. Now before a report can be issued, this legislation seeks to lift the cap. While the state dashboard will show you that Michigan cyber schools are not making the grade, at a minimum they should not be expanded until you're able to view the findings of this report. To do anything less would hold our cyber schools less accountable than the K-12 schools in the system right now. Scratch the surface and research will show that cyber schools have lower achievement rates, lower test scores, and higher dropout rates. Our state students deserve more quality education options, not just more options. Again, for the reasons stated above, I urge you, our board, our community, our staff to make the right choice and at this point in time, oppose this risky legislation. And with that, that's the report for this evening. Thank you. Any comments or questions of Carl before we move on? I'm just going to take a, time, a moment to, to interject something here. In the, uh, and forgive me for interrupting the agenda, but um, you know, at a time when we see continual, continuous regulation from the state of Michigan in Lansing, uh, some good, some bad, um, I'm, I have a real concern about what's happening with this uh, cyber school and the uh, lifting of this cap. And uh, Carl um, and I talked about this before the meeting, and I think it's uh, uh, an appropriate time for uh, this board um, with respect to individual board members contacting legislators and giving, uh, legislators and giving them an idea of what your thoughts are on that particular issue because it's uh, uh, very concerning to me with respect to if we have us all, all this accountability and how we educate children in a public school setting, uh, the same uh, something very similar should be uh, applied to that uh, the cyber opportunity that uh, now uh, looks like it uh, might be coming to a vote. So, give us some thought. Um, I think it's a, a critical. Um, you know, uh, what's good for us should be good for all, and I don't see that as being the 
a common a common ground here with the respect to this uh, what's being introduced so anything else okay I get off my soapbox um, with that we'll go on to the uh, 4.2 sinking fund abatement monitoring service uh, mr. Ellinger and mr. Costas if you'd like to join us sir um, I asked mr. Costas Costas if he would be here as a resource in case you uh, asked me some questions that I didn't know the answer to unlikely as that would be <laughs> boy that's a challenge yeah <laughs> well, stay tuned. Just stay quiet stay, Dave. you don't need to answer stay, stay, stay tuned Dave <laughs> Bids have been accepted for air monitoring services associated with the upcoming asbestos abatement projects. Uh, the projects involve preparing bid documents, identifying scope of work, on-site air monitoring during abatement activities, as well as post-abatement clearance, clearance samples. Uh, administration recommends issuing a purchase order to the low bidder, Sierra Technical Services, services of Freeland, at a total cost of $8,640. This project was previously approved by the board and funding is included in the 2012 sinking fund, sinking fund projects budget. This is primarily for the um, tile that we'd be uh, replacing, taking up um, at the cafeteria in the main office at Dow High School and in about 10,000 square feet of tile work that has been planned and approved already by the board at the Adams Elementary School. Um, at Dow, there's some window caulk that we've discovered has some um, asbestos in it. And really what this boils down to is it's something that the board has approved in the past. We do not have the on-site technical expertise that we need for asbestos um, removal. Um, that is precise enough. There are companies that specialize in it. And it's in our, our students, our staff's best interest to have someone monitoring that um, other than us that really knows what they're doing. And if it's done wrong, you have to cordon off buildings. I went through some of this in my previous district with the huge construction projects we had. Um, it protects our interest to have someone do it. And um, I don't know if there's any more to the recommendation than that um, that we bring before you tonight. Carl, I've done a lot of work in this area too. Are there any special regs pertaining to schools in terms of what the conditions have to be when it's done? Well, you have to cordon off if there are students in the building. There are things you have to do, and you have to redirect airflow, um, Jerry. But beyond that, that's the uh, one thing that I might not know this evening as we address this issue. So we'll ask Mr. Oh, Costas. I think going on, yeah. Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually coming hey, more from a. I'm, I'm actually coming more from a question. Are the, are the, um, area monitors have the same limits as federal EPA limits for every building, or do school buildings have any special? things they must meet uh, in terms of uh, the residual asbestos? Well, we follow the same rules that's, that the general industry uh, okay. does. I mean, we, uh, of course, we, most of our abatement is uh, probably 99% of it's done in the summer anyway when there's less people in the building. Yep. But we uh, close off the areas and do the positive airflow and do the sample testing before and after and make sure we yep. can clear the, clear the area. So. Floor tile is usually pretty. Not very friable. Uh, it's not too friable, uh, and, and neither is really the window caulking. But uh, that was my question. To take the windows out, uh, to do it according to the letter of the law, uh, the, the window framing uh, caulking, we had it tested, and it does contain asbestos. So we've got to get an abatement contractor to take the windows out. Okay, David, um, when is when? So you said time frame is summer. For both of these projects? Correct, yeah. Okay. We typically had to do this most summers when we've done our seeking fund projects. Normally, we've, we've got abatement associated with, uh, we do tile just about every year, and usually the tile. And the last couple of years, we've done boilers and uh, chillers, and that we get into the piping, and we've got to take the old wrap off, okay. which uh, a lot of the old uh, insulated piping has got asbestos elbows and things, so. Do it every summer. So we have a actionable item on the agenda and a request from the administration. So moved. Support. Moved by Mr. Oley, supported by Mr. Wasserman. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Good job, Carol. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> Thank you're, David. You're welcome. <laughs> And with that, we'll move on to 4.3 with uh, best practice and uh, incentive resolution, Mrs. Klein. 
Good evening. This is the follow-up to some action that you began at the last meeting where you indicated to the Michigan Department of Education a willingness to develop a service consolidation plan. That was an important first step in qualifying for the best practices incentive, which is part of the current State School Aid Act, and it provides $100 per pupil of a one-time grant to districts that satisfy at least four of five best practices criteria no later than June 1st. In anticipation that you would take this action this evening, I went ahead and included it in the mid-year budget adjustment, added $822,033 in the mid-year adjustment to reflect this additional money, and you'll see where that is in the next agenda item, as well as I'll talk about what the governor's intent is for uh, different types of incentives as we look ahead to the 12-13 year. So I believe you have a resolution and Madam Secretary, I think you get to read another one. <laughs> okay. A couple months on the job. <laughs> Whereas Section 22F of the school, State School Aid Act provides $100 per pupil one-time grants to districts that satisfy at least four or five best practices criteria not later than June 2012. Whereas the Board of Education of Midland Public Schools desires to receive the $100 per pupil incentive payment, whereas the Midland Public Schools has satisfied at least four of five best practices criteria, whereas eligibility for the incentive payment is contingent upon adopting a resolution that states the district has complied with at least four of five of the best practice criteria. Now, therefore, be it resolved as follows. The Board of Education of Midland Public Schools certifies that the district has complied with the following requirements. The district is the designated policyholder for the medical benefit plan pursuant to Section 22F1B. The district will develop a service consolidation plan pursuant to Section 22F1C a copy of the school board re signed resolution agreeing to develop a service consolidation plan was sent to MDE on January 24, 2012. We agree to send MDE a status report on the development implementation of the plan by February 1st each year. The district has obtained a competitive bid on non-instructional services pursuant to Section 22F1D. The district will provide a link on the district's homepage to the URL for the M Michigan School Data Portal, which will contain the required dashboard indicators pursuant to Section 22F1E. If certain data elements for our district are unavailable from state data collections, we agree to provide those da data in the form and manner determined by the Midland, uh, Michigan Department of Education. The Board of Education of Midland Public Schools authorizes and directs its secretary to file this resolution with the State Aid and School Finance Office of the Michigan Department of Education. All resolutions and parts of resolutions insofar as they conflict with the provisions of this resolution are hereby rescinded. Resolved this 13th day of February 2012. Thank you. Pleasure to the Board. Is there a roll call? Yeah. Move. So, so moved. <coughs> Support the board. Moved by Mr. Washman, supported by Dr. Kaminsky, and we will take a roll call vote on this. Uh, good questions first. Oh, certainly. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, while we've talked about what we have, are there any concerns that that we won't meet any of these that are done, especially the one around the data links that uh, we have to supply yeah. the missing data? Oh, we waited to bring this to you until we were certain we had complied with everything. We already have the data link up on our transparency report. The state provided a link uh, that meets this requirement, and so that's available on our website. So okay. we're 100 percent compliant right now. Thank you. Good. And Linda, you'd anticipate the um, state aid payment associated with this coming in? Probably beginning with the March payment. And, and, and Linda, although we knew that we probably had a chance of meeting four of the five best practices, you couldn't actually include it in this year's budget until we actually had that? Uh, we, at the time that we developed the budget, we knew that we didn't meet the right. requirements. Right, but, but even though it was so possible, likely, but you couldn't actually include it until now. Really? Thus the mid-year adjustment, just to clarify there. Okay, okay any, uh, any comments? No. 
Okay, roll call vote. Right. President Malt. Yes. Vice President Wasserman. Yes. Secretary Baker. Yes. Treasurer Ole. Yes. Member Branstad. Yes. Member Gordon is absent, and Member Kaminsky. Yes. You have your resolution. Thank you. The, the paper is worth eight hundred and twenty-two thousand dollars. We'll make sure that that gets to the <laughs> place for filing. Well, it's a good place to be. Yes. So, and thank, yes. thanks, Linda, for all your hard work on that, and uh, to those in the staff that assisted in that. So. So we'll move on uh, with Mr. Ellinger and Mrs. Klein uh, on 4.4 with the mid-year budget adjustments. Just a couple of comments from me. It's uh, Linda and I had an interesting conversation. We've had lots of interesting conversations <coughs> since the uh, governor's budget proposal came out on Thursday. But one of the things she said was, you know, Carl, um, we're about a month later than we would normally bring a, a mid-year budget adjustment to you, but maybe it's a good idea in the future, and this was her suggestion, that we always bring it after the uh, governor's address. <laughs> the problem is when he does that on Thursday, um, his budget address, I don't know how many people really know this, is 178 pages long. And so it was Linda's job to read it this weekend. So uh, well, that was to wait until his budget address and then see how you well, use the next three or four days isn't necessarily <coughs> the uh, smartest thing for us to do either. So Linda's done, I think, a superb job of preparing the uh, mid-year budget adjustment like she always does. And I think for the board and our viewers tonight, they'll uh, see some eye-opening figures here tonight. So turn it over to Mrs. Klein. All right. The presentation will take two parts. The first part is the budget adjustment proper, and then the remainder of the time will be spent talking about what this might mean for next year, including bringing in the latest information from at least the governor's proposed budget. So this is our revision number one. We always have another revision later in the year. Uh, revisiting our timeline, we first started talking quite publicly about the 12 uh, the 11-12 budget back on May 23rd at the board workshop. Uh, that led to some decisions that allowed us to pull a budget together and we brought that to you and for a public hearing on June 13. It was available for public comment for two weeks. You took action on it on 20, June 27, putting it in place by the statutorily required July 1. Now here we are with our mid-year revision. Uh, which by this point seems like very old news to me because I had all the buildings get the information to me by mid-December thinking that I would be able to finish it all uh, between the, the week between Christmas and New Year's. It's a good time to work on budget. It's pretty quiet then. Uh, but then we had a few issues with the MCV settlement, which I'll talk about later, that really necessitated waiting until we had our January state aid payment. So here we are February 13, and in hindsight it seemed like a good move because I have additional information to bring to you, and it's probably uh, a little better picture of what 1213 might bring than we would have had if I'd brought it to you on the schedule. The final revision, barring any unforeseen changes between now and June, will actually take place on June 25th, shortly after you adopt the 1213 budget in that same meeting will bring the final revision Remember that we have to make the revenues and expenditures match as closely as possible to what we think they will be. So there's one more round of tightening up that goes on between now and June 25th. The snapshot is, I'll jump right to the bottom, one-time revenues and savings have reduced our projected operating deficit by a third. It's good news to bring at this time of year. You can see we started out the year expecting revenues of 75.9 million. They're actually coming in closer to 78.6. Expenditures, we expected to be 82.9 million, leaving an operating deficit of nearly $7 million. Uh, we now are looking at expenditures of 83.1 million, and the operating deficit has been reduced. 4.5, and the slides that follow will have the details on what brought these numbers of, about. But I think it's a good sign that we reached this time of year, unlike two years ago where I had to bring you additional reductions. At this time, our picture has improved somewhat because of some of the, the one-time events that have taken place. On the revenue side, 
These are arranged in descending order of effect of budget. And the first item up there is the MCV settlement, Midland Cogeneration Venture. Fairly complicated, and I'm going to take a minute or two to walk you through that because this is a very unusual set of circumstances that occurred here. And we had just the perfect combination of events happen. We had MCV appealing its taxable value going back a couple of years. And this time, instead of paying and having all of the local entities begin to accrue interest on any potential overpayment, they chose to short pay. In other words, they paid only the taxes that they felt they should have paid. So because of the amount that was involved, our state aid had already been adjusted. But along with this, there was the reclassification of their property from non-principal resident exempt property, used to be known as the old industrial, uh, to industrial personal property. And the difference there is the non-PRE is subject to the full 18 mills, whereas the industrial personal property is only subject to our hold harmless millage. And this is going to begin to sound familiar as we cycle back to last fall when we established a rate and then had to reestablish a rate when the property was reclassified for 2009. And that's because the hold harmless calculation is our expected enrollment times $415.31 per pupil. That generates the amount we're permitted to raise. That's divided by the taxable value of the properties that are subject to that, not the non-PRE. So when the property was reclassified, it put a large amount of value into the denominator of that calculation. And that's why in the fall, we had to change the rate. Each year, the current year is adjusted at, to account for any prior year changes in either enrollment or taxable value. The 41531 is the constant in that equation. There is no provision for adjusting that rate for changes that occur more than a year back. So what happened in this instance was MCV property was reclassified, put a large amount of money into that calculation. We were able to adjust for last year and for this year. However, the reclassification went back two years prior to that. Now, whenever property comes out of non-PRE, the state makes it up. They readjust. We get what's called a page two adjustment. And in a one-time payment, they pay us the equivalent of 18 mils of taxes on that property with the expectation that we have a situation that has required refunding it to the taxpayer. Well, in this case, the taxpayer was entitled to a refund only of the difference between the 18 mils and the hold harmless. And in the, this case, it was roughly going back to those years between two and a half and three mils. And we had no way, there's no statutory permission for adjusting those prior year taxes. So we received, I'll just give you an example of a number, uh, back for the 2008 tax year, the state refunded almost $4.2 million. That's the 18 mils on the value. We had to refund to the taxpayer $3.6 million, leaving us with $537,000 for that hold harmless millage. Now, in other years, we would have been able to adjust. So we have two years where that took place, and those two years add up to $1,076,423. Uh, I will say, had this happened in reverse, we also would have no recourse. If the property had been taken out of that equation, the state would have immediately reduced in single payment 18 mils, and yet the company would have paid us only the balance between the 18 and the hold harmless. So what works one way works the other. Now we have a lot of options for how to handle this one-time occurrence, and we'll talk more about those at the budget workshop in, in April. because I been thinking about different ways that we might deal with that money. So right now, it's just showing up as one-time revenue for the 11-12 year, and certainly it's, it's coming out for next year. The remaining two years where that also has happened, 
were adjusted for in our hold harmless rate. So there is no extra money to the district. We were able to adjust it that way. And in fact, it's helpful that we had this one-time money come in in a single payment because the adjustment for this current year required that we refund to MCV back about three weeks ago, early January, $1.7 million. That balance is being made up now on our monthly state aid payments. So we're getting just a fraction of that. We won't receive the full 1.7 until we've received our last payment in August. So it, it's helpful that this money came in because it helped offset of reimbursements that, that we were required to make for the current year. Prior years, it all happens at a, in a single payment, but current year adjustments get spread over the uh, fiscal year. Before I go on to anything else, were there questions about the MCV? All right, let me move on to the other additional revenues. The best practice incentive you just acted on, and you can see the amount there. Uh, enrollment also came in larger this year than we had anticipated, so that increase of about 50 students has led to $408,841 of additional revenue, and I've classified that as ongoing because those are students we have with us, and certainly we're starting from a higher enrollment base. Also, oh, then, after then the then budget... Then yes? If I interrupt you, where'd those 50 show up? Topic? All over. Okay. No, no single grade level. Okay. Um, I would say perhaps a few more at the high school level than at the elementary, but I, I can't point to a single place and say, ah, there were 30 particular grades. Uh, also, the Midland County Educational Service Agency received a three-year grant from local foundations to continue funding for the instructional consultation teams. Uh, so we were able to add that. I've included that as ongoing because we'll receive that this year, next year, and the year after. And then our federal grants were up $192,670 beyond what we expected. And again, the federal year doesn't exactly match our year. The federal year runs on an October 1 basis. And so we're always told in the spring to budget 85% of what we received the prior year and then we have to wait to see how the federal government acts over the summer uh, to determine what the actual amount is going to be. So ongoing, about 855000 of additional money, almost $1.9 million of one time. This is in addition to what was already there. We did have $912,125 of one-time revenue already in the budget because when the state school aid was approved, it was very late and close to when we were pulling this all together, but we knew that there was some money in there to offset some of the cost of the MIPSERS increase, the Michigan Public School Employee Retirement System increase. And so that added to the total means that we've got about $2.8 million of money that will come out, and then we'll talk about a little later on about what it looks like the governor is proposing. Uh, cost reductions. Those in excess of 50,000. I know 50,000 may seem like a pretty large number. If this were a household budget of about $83,000, I would be reporting to you on any change over $50, just to put it in perspective. Uh, so these are changes that represent at close to one-tenth of 1% 1 change in the budget. Uh, the first one is that we started the year, as we always do, with <laughs> the cost of MCEA steps and category changes and the related payroll taxes on that. And as a result of a public act change last summer, we've needed to revisit that because Public Act 54 of 2011 now prohibits the retroactive payment of any wage or benefit levels or amounts greater than those in effect on the expiration date of the collective bargaining agreement. And it also prohibits us from paying either one of those until we have a settled contract. So in an ordinary year, if we had started the year without a contract, uh, we still would have paid our teachers the steps and the category changes 
that would have gone into effect at the end of the close of the previous school year. This public act prohibits that. And I really struggled with how much to take out. This is the full amount. And the reason I did that, and you'll notice I have a statement that when there is a settlement, we will need to add back in any of the related costs. But as of today, we only have 44% of the year. And we know that contract settlements take some time. And so to try to guess at what amount that should be, decided it was probably more reasonable to just take the full amount out, know that when there is a settlement, we will need to calculate whatever the cost of steps and category changes are from that point forward. And we will add those back in as the adjustment. So this does reflect the full amount out because I, I really couldn't begin to guess at when there would be a settlement. But I do know that we're scheduled to meet this Wednesday. If we were to have an agreement at the end of the day Wednesday, there's a voting process. There's uh, you know, ratification here. By the time all that would be done, we probably would be down to no more than a third of the year at, at very best. Uh, we also had some positions that were budgeted and at the beginning of the year, but they ended up either not being filled yet or they were filled just recently. And so the entire payroll cost of those, including the payroll taxes, is about 180000 That's one time, because once those positions are filled, the full cost will go into effect next year. Also as a result of changes in our insurance carrier for our ancillary insurances, those would be the long-term disability, the accidental death and dismemberment, and it seems like there's one, one other one in there. Uh, we were able to save $65,000 off the cost of those. So uh, that, that's the ongoing savings that's built in. That took effect, I believe, September 1 was the plan year. Yes? Linda, is that, uh, was it through a bid, bidding process? Or is that how we saved that money? Or? Uh, we had had um, all of those bid a couple of years ago when we had all of our plans bid. But it actually was the result of we were in the process of shifting to self-funded dental. Okay. And our dental carrier said, uh, we think we might be able to do something for you on your other insurances. And they came forward with amounts that were better than those that had been previously bid. So having gone through the bid process, we knew that what they were offering was an even larger savings. And we jumped at it. And uh, I think we have a three-year commitment on those uh, with no price increase over the three years. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions on, on this one? Right, I'm going to have to put on my glasses to read my little handwritten notes. <laughs> Cost increases. Again, those over $50,000. We're recommending to you that we purchase nine school buses. That would be two special education or orthopedic buses, as well as seven regular education buses or gen ed buses. Estimated cost on that is $727,000. And the reason we're doing that now is that we had postponed this decision back in June because we knew that there was a countywide study on the feasibility of contracting with a third party for transportation. This is the second study in five years that has not been able to demonstrate clear, significant savings for all of the districts involved. So it looks as if we're going to continue to provide our transportation for the foreseeable future. So we need to continue to refresh our bus fleet, and we badly need to make up for those years in which we did not purchase new buses. I looked back at our history, and this goes back to we made the first decision to scale back on bus purchases all the way back in the 2005-2006 year. And then we had two years after that when we purchased no buses. And then we purchased a very limited number of buses the year after that. And before adding these nine buses, we are 16 buses behind on fleet replenishment out of a fleet of roughly 60. So this will put us only seven behind. We should be purchasing six each year. And at the rate of nine per year, we will need to continue to purchase nine this year, next year, the year after, 
and then the following year it would only be one additional bus and then we would be back onto a, a routine schedule. At the time, deferring those bus purchases seemed like a good idea and if it were a one-time deferral it probably would be easier to catch up but to try to catch up for four years of limited or no bus purchasing has put us in a, a very poor position regarding where we are in, in fleet refreshing. On the federal program side, those numbers uh, need to match the increased revenue. That's always the way federal programs work. They must exactly, you must expend what it is that you receive. So it's not additional money that can supplant what you're doing. Uh, those of you who've been on, I'm sure, the curriculum committee know that you hear a lot about supplement, not supplant. And so these are supplemental expenses. We're always very careful to adhere to that. Uh, final cost increase that exceeded $50,000 is the company that we were working with on our copiers and printers uh, filed for bankruptcy recently, uh, leaving us in probably a better condition than many, many other governments and school districts across the state, but it has left us needing to find another source of support. And so that's our estimate right now. Uh, Mrs. Lauchs and Mr. Dietzik have been very, very diligent in pursuing some options. And uh, I believe what we're probably going to do is bid out the entire operation. We've already had uh, any number of companies that are aware of this bankruptcy and are swooping in on all of the governments uh, willing to help us. <laughs> and they, they are offering some fairly favorable terms, but rather than just jump at the first one that comes, I think we've decided we'll go through a formal bid process and see what we do because we might have the opportunity to actually come out ahead of where we were. So cost increases, not quite a million dollars, and the bulk of that with bus purchases. Linda, I have a question. On, on the bus purchases, we don't increase the overall number of buses. We de no. decommission some of the older ones in. Yes. I think that some of the things that I've heard is that our maintenance expenses go up and sometimes we have buses break down and you know that can be scheduling and safety issues also as well so I would imagine these buses get a lot of miles they get a lot of use and you have to yes keep the fleet refreshed in terms of that at six buses <coughs> a year and a fleet size is 60 it means that at the time of retirement a bus typically would be about 10 years old and it's time to retire. Uh, yeah. 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 Tell yeah. them how many miles are we yeah. typically on yeah. a bus like that. Oh. We have some that are in the range of 240,000. Yeah. That's and a lot of miles for a bus. Yeah. And as we're going into a, a regime where we're busing to broader expanse of people than we used to bus in the past, I think it's very important we have a good bus fleet. Well, and the other thing I think it's important for everybody to remember is that this enhancement millage that was passed a number of years ago is designed to support that. Yes. That's what yep. we went to the voters for. So it makes sense that uh, while we've been um, a few years without, it's time to try to start catching up. So, And we've talked about this quite a bit at FFO, and we're very supportive of that. Then can you just mention what physically happens to those buses we decommissioned? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, we try to high grade. We will keep the best one or two uh, for substitute buses. And then the rest get sold. The uh, value of a 10 or 12 year old school bus is next to nothing. A as you can imagine, as they would depreciate $70,000, $80,000 over the course of 10 or 12 years. So they may, if we're lucky, we may sell them to somebody for $1,500. Uh, sell to my college kid. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you know, whoever buys them has to repaint them because just a, your trivia bit for the evening, the color called National School Bus Yellow mm -hmm. may be used only school on buses. actual school buses. Interesting. In yeah. fact, there's a, a district in northwestern Michigan that has contracted with another government to provide its transportation. Those buses may not be painted yellow. And they also may not adhere to the same rules regarding stopping traffic. Those are very, very specific yeah. to big yellow school buses. Uh, in case you wonder, too, if you've been by here during the last few days, 
you'll see we've had a state police car sitting over in front of our bus garage. School buses are held to a very, very high standard. I would venture to say that school buses are probably safer than many of the vehicles that our children are brought to school in or drive themselves in. And this has been our time for our state police inspection. Uh, he, this, I think, was day four. And he had completed, according to Mr. Vallier, 36 buses as of this morning. So I'll give you an idea of how thorough they, they are on, on the inspection. And they have the right, if they feel that there's anything truly unsafe, to pull that bus off the road immediately. Smaller items they'll identify as needing repair. But if there's something that they truly feel puts students at risk, that bus is taken out of commission. And there's no arguing or saying, well, just give us a couple of days. No, unsafe is unsafe. And since we're talking about buses, did our bus from I-75 make it bad? I know there wasn't any kids on it, but. Yeah, yeah actually, we, well, good little uh, detour here. We had two buses on I-75. We had the bus that was coming back after being repaired in anticipation of its state police uh, inspection. And that's the one that was actually involved in all the fray. But we also had a bus that had dropped off students at an athletic contest in Flint. And she was coming back empty. And she got caught in the backup. She wasn't actually in any of the accidents. But she ended up, I think she reported, sitting there for three, three and a half hours before traffic moved. And she, she was stopped, I think, at M84. Mm -hmm. And at least according to what I saw in, in the media, the backup extended all the way back to Bridgeport. Wow. It, it was absolutely massive. But both, both came back. And uh, according to the reports from the bus garage, actually even the bus that was involved in the 70 car incident suffered very, very minimal damage. Good. So okay. should be back on the road in no time. And everybody was fine. <laughs> yes. Nobody hurt. Yep. Oh, so that's the budget adjustments. But it leads us to what does the future hold? And for the future, we have to look at enrollment declines, retirement rate increases, the effect of all-day kindergarten, the loss of one-time revenue, potential new time, new one-time revenues. And as Mr. Ellinger indicated, some of this information is very, very new. And of course, much of it at this time of year is fairly tentative. But this is what I believe we're looking at. Very preliminary enrollment estimate. I already have my Stanford consultant's estimate for next year. But we have to compare that against our certified second official count. The official count was last Wednesday. But now it goes through a fairly lengthy process. And I won't actually have an FTE or full-time equivalent that I can use for enrollment for about another month. And then I always like to go back and check it against what does our enrollment look like. And this year, I'm going to be particularly interested in what is happening at kindergarten. Because with our decision to go to full day kindergarten, I estimated that we would bring back about 30 of the 59 or 60 students that attend kindergarten in other districts that I can identify through the non-resident school of choice uh, reports. There may be other students that are out there attending private or parochial options. I'm really hoping that I'm low. Uh, but with the blended count of 10% spring, 90% fall, 30 additional kindergartners would actually add 27 to the blended count. So that's my expectation, is that we will have some extra students there. And that would mean that elementary is only down a total of 29 from 11-12. Secondary, we'll see, continue to see the larger declines as the smaller elementary classes are moving in and the, the larger high school classes are moving out. I think we'll be down, at this point, I would say about 113. And right now, at this time of year, I just estimate special education at, at what it is at current time. So overall enrollment, I would expect to be roughly 8,063 students or a decline of 142. And in the blended count, the 10% spring, 90% fall, that actually translates to 8,084 students. Uh, 
the good news here is that I believe the decline is beginning to wane. This is a smaller reduction in enrollment than we have seen, although you can certainly see from the numbers up there that over the course of a decade, decade and a year maybe, we've lost 1,600 students, 16.1% drop in enrollment. And this is not unique to Midland Public. This is the picture across the state in many, many, many districts. So that's the enrollment part. Now for the fun. Last Thursday, the governor introduced his budget, and there was a lot of hoopla about whether it was a 1% increase or a 3% increase or a 5% increase. Honestly, none of that matters. What really matters is what gets put into the line items of the State School Aid Act. Because an increase in the total dollars allocated to the state school aid does not translate into an increase in total dollars coming to Midland Public. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, so what we do know is that the foundation is not expected to change. It will remain at $8,141 as it has this year. Uh, there are one-time revenues for a MIPSERS offset again, about $15 more per pupil than was allocated this year, a new best practice incentive, and a student achievement incentive. And there are some differences here. The student achievement incentive uh, assigns points to students in grades three through eight, and then again at the high school, based on whether they showed growth on the state assessments. And our high school students haven't even taken those assessments yet. So at this point, it is impossible for us to figure out if we're going to qualify for those. But assuming that we reach the threshold, the payment would be $30 for student growth in reading, $30 for student growth in math, and $40 for student growth on all of the high school assessments. And at this point, that's, there's really not much more detail around that particular incentive. But it's an attempt to move toward rewarding those districts that have positive student achievement and move a little bit away from financial incentives for business practices, which may or may not actually reflect the outcomes of the district. Now, on the business practice side, it's not the same best practices that we had this year. Some are the same, but some are different. Uh, one is continued to be the policy holder, which we know we've met. Uh, and going back to Dr. Kaminsky's question, this year I will build that best practice incentive into the budget if it makes it through the final process of House and Senate and committees, uh, because I can already tell you that we meet these best practices. So the first is, um, we have to allow schools a choice. And we have five out of six to go after. Policy holder, I believe, is one. Uh, we have to assess this one I don't think we'll make. Assess student growth in each subject area at least twice per year. Sounds good so far. Using competency-based online assessments. I, I don't think we meet that one. But the next one, to support opportunities for students to receive post-secondary credits while in high school. We've participated in dual enrollment for years. I think we can check that one off. Offer online instructional programs or blended learning opportunities. I think we can check that one off. And the dashboard, same thing. So as we sit here this evening, I believe that as the governor has envisioned the financial best practices, we're going to meet that. And what we're not quite sure about is how much money is there. <laughs> because that's a little less clear. The act allocated uh, a large amount and said that the student achievement incentives will equal $100 total. And then whatever is left that isn't paid out will go into this other incentive. So it, it looks like the early thinking is instead of $100 per pupil, it's more likely to be 75 or 60 or 75 
Well, is it fair to say when you look at all the incentive dollars that the governor alluded to in his budget proposal, that you will build in those things that are absolutes that you know we can meet, but we won't build anything in that we have to speculate on that we might meet. Exactly. And that's just the prudent yeah. thing to do because depending on what your interest is in this as an interested constituent, some people are going to want us to assume we're going to get all that. And I can tell you just on the student growth issue when I was at that accountability tour, if you're already at 90% above in terms of making adequate yearly progress, they're not going to hold it to continuing to grow for this year. But that, not, that may not be the same definition for the growth that the governor is referring to. And what's very clear to me from attending um, that accountability tour down in Lansing is that um, CEPI's not talking with the Bureau of Assessment and Accountability and they're beginning to centralize so much down inside the Michigan Department of Ed and Treasury. It's even clear to them that they need to have better communication about what they intend to, of all this. So that leaves the districts really hanging on what target is it that you're going after. So we can't speculate yeah. when it comes the, to planning the budget. The governor's proposal says that at least at the grades three through eight, uh, students, I'll, I'll summarize for you, students who aren't proficient and continue to not be proficient, they get zero points. Students who aren't proficient and actually manage to lose ground, become even less not, or more not proficient, also are zero points. Uh, students that are not proficient but maintain where they are get one point. Students who are proficient and stay where they are are worth two points. And students who are not proficient and jump all the way to proficient, they're worth three points. Add all of that up for all of the students in grades three through eight, divide by the number of students, and if the average is 1.5 or higher, we will qualify for that incentive. Now that's the easy one. Reading and math are, are simple. <laughs> At the high school level, there's a reference to looking at student achievement or student growth on all four of the assessments and developing a four-year linear regression for the district and then comparing that with a four-year linear regression. I'm not making this up. Linear regression for the state, and if the district is above the state, then we will qualify. Last Friday, Mr. Cooper and I sat down and talked about this, and I had sent it to him, and I said, at what point would we think we might even know this to get a sense of would we be able to build it into the budget? And he said, on the high school side, that data probably doesn't even come back to the district until sometime in June at the very earliest, because those students haven't even taken that assessment yet. It makes reference to the 11-12 assessment. But neither one of us could figure out exactly what it is that they were doing with that. So there will have to be more clarity around that. But it's very unlikely that for at least that piece, I'd be able to include it in the June budget, because we wouldn't have the data yet to begin to estimate whether we think we make it. I would guess that we probably would be in pretty good shape on the other two, just given the large numbers of our students who are already proficient. By the way, this refers to the new CUP scores, not the old CUP scores. Uh, also in the executive budget, and this is no surprise because this was he, last year, we ha he recommended a two-year budget, and so this rate was known. The retirement rate as a percent of payroll is going to 27.37%. And the reason why I wanted to show this is when is an increase a decrease is if you look back to 2001, 2002, you get a real sense of why we have felt the pain that we have over the last decade. Foundation allowance was a little bit higher, but at that time we actually had $293.31 per pupil of Section 20J payments. So our revenue per pupil was a guaranteed $8,215.31. Our foundation is 8,141. If we qualify for all three of those one-time revenues, we would be at 8,428.36, but a good chunk of that would be one time, and we wouldn't be able to roll that forward to the next year. Back in 2001, 2002, the retirement rate was 12.17 percent. Total district expenses on that retirement were 6.4 million or about $666 per pupil. For 2012-2013, the
the retirement cost for the district is going to be just about $12.5 million. And the cost on a per pupil basis will have jumped to $1,542.23. So even with the so-called increases, we have less in terms of nominal dollars, don't even talk about inflation adjusted dollars, to spend on our instruction for 12-13 than we did 11 years ago. Think about how many fewer FTEs we have this yes, year than we did right back well. yes. relative to their requirements. Well, that, that's double what it was, a lot less FTEs. That is how we have made the adjustments over the years, right. is we have reduced the numbers of people we pay, we have reduced the pay of those we pay in order to keep the salary side lower as the retirement percent goes mm -hmm. up and up and up. And even though the retirement cost to us has more than doubled, if you will, the incremental be benefit to the employees hasn't changed, really. No. Is that a fair statement? That is a very fair yeah. statement. Just keeping the fund solvent. Yeah. Donald Lancey. If, if, if it's solvent. So and Linda, the early, while it's not legislatively binding on a future legislation, as he's looking out to a two-year budget, wasn't the advertising 31% or 32% on retirement rate for the following year? 31.21%. So yes. think what that means. That's, that's built in. Yeah. Uh, and I'll talk a little a bit more setter. about what's happening on the retirement front in a, in a second. Uh, so this is what it really looks like for us. 2011-12 in this budget is $78.6 million of revenues. Changes will be knowing that I think we'll qualify for the best practices in the MIPSERS offset, that'll be about a million five of revenue. Kindergarten enrollment increase I think might bring about $220,000. The other enrollment reduction that I would have expected would reduce $1.3 million. We take out the MCV settlement and all the one-time revenues, the current MIPSERS offset, because the new MIPSERS offset is not on top of that. It replaces it. It's about $15 more per pupil than this one. Uh, and the 11-12 best practices money goes away. We also lose the revenue that we've had from kindergarten complement because of the all-day program. Uh, the governor's proposed budget does maintain the language that we expected to see on full day kindergarten for full FTE. So I think we made a good call on that one. So total revenues, uh, excluding the $100 per pupil incentive for student achievement that we don't know if we'll qualify, about $76 million for the 12-13 school year. On the expense side, the items that will be increased expenses will be, we will have to account for the teacher salary schedule steps. So let's, let's assume that we have a settlement by early March. We would go back and all of our teachers would step at that time and then next year they would step again. So the overall, actually, this number would assume that we had gone through the whole year and we didn't have a settlement until the end of the school year. So this number would be somewhat reduced, although remember our expenses would be somewhat higher for this current year. But over our current budget uh, in, for the mid-year adjustment with the expenditures of $83.1 million, uh, teacher salary schedule steps would have a two-year jump. And I, I can see you're puzzled, and I did a calculation on this. It, I, may need to walk you through that one separately on, on how and why it works. Because even though the law says there is no retroactivity and we don't pay steps until they do go into effect, it does not say that those steps are lost forever. So when the, stu when the contract is settled, the teacher steps. And then when the new contract or when the new year goes, they would step again. Hey, well, when you say the teacher steps, what Linda is saying is not that the teacher goes back and recaptures 100% mm -mm. of that step from when they started back in the fall. It's just if we settle a contract, and let's say it's April 1st, from April 1st through June 30th, they would step at whatever the salary is associated with that step for that part of the year. Mm -hmm. That's what the law allows so the, for. 
the total cost to the district would be less for the year without a contract, but eventually the full cost of that step would be. So they would the next two years were the steps. Yeah. They, well, the, the next year you're going to pay for the people who stepped in April but, but if you plus didn't, just, hi, the new ones. If you didn't settle to June 30th or July 1, then it would be a different story. No. 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 I, Rick, maybe I get clear. No, I understand. I, yeah. I think you're, so, so you're right. The bottom line is they don't lose it permanently. They just lose it for the Right. For the, the, the overall year. cost of the district still remains less so than it would be had. Theoretically, just theoretically, if, if a teacher at a certain point was getting a 5% step, and they didn't get that till let's say May one because we didn't settle, so they would get two months of that mm -hmm. for this year. Mm -hmm. But then come July one, they would get five percent plus five percent, mm -hmm. right? Yes. What I'm hearing you say. Yep. They would go to the next step. Okay. They would have lost out on the on ten months of this year. Exactly. But for next year, we'd be paying the equivalent of two years worth of steps. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the increase of the retirement rate and how that interacts with the one-time payment has a very similar effect. Both of those pieces uh, are, are quite difficult to track, but even though the state is offsetting a little bit of that cost increase, next year we really have to go back and recoup the cost increase that we didn't have this year because some of it was offset, but I've got figures on that one too. Uh, uh, so the retirement rate next year is going to go up 11.9%, another $1.3 million cost. And although there is an offset this year and an offset next year, if we go back and compare to 10-11, the total cost increase to the district, excluding the offsets, was uh, about a 3 million dollar increase and there will be about one nine of offsets over the course of those two years so the offsets aren't completely offsetting the increase they are just mitigating it and theoretically allowing us to adjust in a more gradual manner than if we had but we still with two years of rapid increases, we still have to go back and make sure that we can cover those those previous increases. Those offsets aside, though, if I just simplify this and look at this, I'm looking at the two middle ones. It's $2.6 million in added costs being imposed to us by the state, in my mind. Mm -hmm. Just right there. Fair statement? Mm -hmm. 2.6 additional go back expenses. To when is an increase a decrease? Then we have the all-day yeah, kindergarten. We have our issues on our revenue and enrollment and all that we, stuff. Yeah. $2.6 million additional cost to us is automatically yeah. dictated to us by the state. Actually, like you should that. probably add the and next one, too. And the next the year, the next year you'll have another $2 million for the next up to 30-some percent mm -hmm. retirement. Right, right. But I'm just mm -hmm. saying that all-day kindergarten is imposed on us. Yeah. They're imposing additional yes. cost to us. Yeah. We had a choice, but yeah. not really. Not yeah. really. Yeah. Well, yeah. Bigger if loss. Hobson's choice. Still. Yeah. If we'd not done all-day kindergarten, we would have imposed on us. Reduce. Yeah. The, the which, FTE. Which side of the ledger like you want to put it up? Full FTE. Yeah. Uh, and then we have those positions that will be filled a full year, so those are added back. Total expenditures uh, right now, 87, almost 87.3 million would be the <coughs> expectation with these. And these do not assume <coughs> that there would be any other changes. They're could be utility changes, could be gas price changes, but all of those are relatively small uh, in terms of the overall effect of the, the budget. But just think about how this has been played out about this increase. We're going to you know, update the education budget and our commitment, blah, blah, blah. What it doesn't say is that in our case, it's, I don't know what the number is, two and a half, two point seven percent incremental costs have been imposed on us for next year, right? Mm -hmm. And then Amazing how things get spun. And and then when you look at that, all you do is put a rough brackets around that and then multiply it by the enrollment decrease. Right. Oh, right. Right. But I'm saying that's not imposed. It's by local. The state. It's, it's local. Yeah. Yeah. The, the governor's budget is basically imposed a 2.5 percent or whatever the number is percent increase on us for next year, just to start with. Mm -hmm. So if you want to pass some of that information on to your friends electronically, pass that Mitch Bean, <laughs> former House Fiscal Agency Director's article that I sent all of you. Um, on to other people. 
that does as good a job we think at <laughs> describing. Uh, so I, when Lend, I was happy when I saw Linda use the um, heading. When is an increase, uh, a de decrease, really? Well, well, what's really interesting, I've communicated some of this to our legislators, is that the cap off charters and the cap off this cyber school is going to potentially accelerate the drain of our pupil enrollment. Plus money to get Taking out. money out of the state state aid fund, absolutely. Yeah, so, so your uh, per pupil funding is relatively stable, but the erosion risk is certainly there as time goes on as another factor if we don't need any more to add on to it so all right so what does this look like in the bottom line whoops fund balance forecast uh, at a hundred percent spending we think we would end this year at with ten million dollars of available fund balance however the operating deficit the difference between those revenues and expenditures is actually eleven point two and theoretically, we would have a deficit fund balance of $1.2 million or negative 3.12%. Uh, at 98% spending, little different situation, we would start the year with almost, uh, well, 11.7 in the fund balance. And the operating deficit, also assuming 98% spending next year, would leave us with about almost 2.2 million in fund balance <clears throat> on June 30th, 2013. And if we were able to bring it in at 96% each year, we would have about 5.6 million in fund balance. And Linda, our average in recent years has been 97.5. Mm -hmm. However, I'll jump to the bottom here. These are changes that all have the potential to change our budget in the millions. These are all what I would call the seven digit changes. And it's really too early to begin to make decisions based on what you just saw because all of these can significantly change the picture. Uh, as we finish up the spring FTE and look at what kindergarten might mean, enrollment. I'd love to be able to bring you more pupils than, than I just showed you in the, the earlier projection. Uh, remember, we are still negotiating with the Midland City Education Association. Uh, contract settlement there could mean significant changes in our overall budget. Changes in the State School Aid Act. Right now, this is just the governor's proposed budget. The next step is the House and the Senate have to introduce theirs. There'll be a lot of discussion. And probably as we get into late May, we'll find out exactly where they go with all of this. And it's an election year. I'm sure there'll be a great deal of wrangling. It might be just moving around the numbers on the table, but certainly it would be to our benefit if these one-time dollars would become guaranteed dollars and we could actually build those into our budget going forward. Uh, changes in the school employees retirement system. That could have a huge effect for us. Back in the fall, uh, Speaker Jace Bolger named representatives to a MIPSERS reform work group, recognizing that the constant increase in rates is becoming unsustainable for school districts. And even with the offsets that the state is able to provide, it's not enough. And next year, or 13-14, we'll be very close to a third of our payroll. We'll then go back to MIPSERS. And Linda, that's all a defined benefit program, I trust? Uh, no, not all of it. No. It's for, it, it, there have been a lot of changes over the last few years. The most recent one that accompanied the incentive of a couple of years ago put any new employees who were hired after, I think it was July 1, 2010, yeah. are in what's called a hybrid program. It has a defined benefit component, but it also has a defined contribution program. Okay, but only in the last year or two. So if yeah. you look at the whole universe of retirees, yeah. that's a Yeah, and there, uh, there's a lot of ideas that are being bandied about. This work group probably will report, again, probably in the May time frame and it will be interesting to see what it is they recommend. One that would have an effect on us that would also, it would help stabilize the system, is to recapture what they call the stranded costs. 
and that's the payments into the system that are lost anytime a district contracts for a job mm -hmm. and is no longer paying into MIPSERS. Currently, that's a free pass, which is why it's been so popular, <laughs> because any contract employee, we don't have to pay the 27 or 31 percent into the system. They're beginning to recognize that that's not necessarily a good, sustainable way to operate the overall retirement system, so there might be some way that they assess a surcharge <laughs> on our contracts. You're kidding. That's one of the things that's out there is a, a possibility. So just think about that That's because ridiculous. we heard at the soups conference that that could be as much as 5% of the payroll of your contractor that you're contracting with. Mm -hmm. Now, Linda heard it could be 10%. So on the one hand, the state is forcing us to yeah. bid services, right. um, which would imply that this is a good practice. And now that they've really thought about this, they're saying, well, that may not be so good because you're taking people out of the retirement system. And those of you that went down there because we asked you to down that road, now we're going to penalize you because we'll surcharge you 5 to 10% on the wages. Insanity. I, I can't even rationalize it's, it's it. It's insanity. I can't even rationalize that logic. Uh, other proposals are to increase the contributions that employees are paying. I, truly, there's a, a very lengthy list of options. I expect that we'll begin to hear more about them and they'll filter through the system. But I wouldn't be at all surprised if there or changes by the end of May. I think what worries me systemically is that it will put our employees in the same position they were a couple of years ago, where we're approaching the end of the school year, and they have to make a rapid decision about whether they want to retire or not. We, will, of course, will have completed our staffing. <laughs> we will have completed our budgeting. And our employees will have maybe two weeks at the end of the school year to make a decision on if they want to avoid some of these changes and retire. I, I can see the potential for creating a lot of turmoil at the end of the school year, which is unfortunate. Two years ago, at least, it was more of a positive decision on whether employees wanted to qualify for the enhanced incentive. I suspect this will be a decision on can they avoid some of the, the disincentives to continue on in the plan. But it's just a, a forecast right now. Uh, the other piece that's out there, it would be our current and our future ESA special education bill back. This current year, it's $726,000. That's the difference between what we are paying for services and then what comes back to us in the Act 18 millage. Not too many years ago, that was actually the other way around. We received money back from the millage to help operate our own local programs. That number has been getting higher and higher and higher and it remains to be seen what will happen with that. That one I don't think would rise to the level of uh, million dollar changes, but it could certainly add hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to our expenses. So with that, now that you know the complete picture, I will ask you to take action on the 11-12 mid-year budget adjustments. So moved. Support. Moved by Mr. Oley, supported by Mr. Wasserman. And thank you, Linda, for a very detailed mid-year report. I have one more question. The, uh, the ICT grant was ready or be scheduled to be run out. Is that correct? Uh, it that had renewed? expired. And There's some question about the response to intervention and some of the work we're doing in the elementary level. Yes. So that was a little bit in question. That's good for, what, three years mm -hmm. now? With yep. local ESA applied so. for a new grant, and they were notified, I think, perhaps mid-summer uh, that they had received their grant. And then, okay. of course, that three years of stability. us, and okay. it's a three-year grant. Okay, that's great. It's a good that's sign. Great. And, Linda, can you go back to your first slide, your very first one? Uh, the timeline or the? No, that one. Okay. <laughs> that's what I'm looking for. So basically what you're saying with the revised budget with the new one-time revenues and the expenses and the da-da-da-da-da, net-net, we are still spending $4.5 million more a year than we're taking in. Correct. I just want to make that a very big highlight to people that we are still digging a hole of $4.5 million a year. And then when we hear what Linda had to say about next year, mm -hmm. we may get a few one-time revenue enhancements. The any foundation allowance increase are going to be offset by retirement fund increases. So we're just going to keep digging that hole. 
well, and Alex is going to say the same thing, Jerry, and think about how fortunate we were that all these one-time adjustments were in our favor this year, the 2.6 million, whatever the number was. Even with all that favorable stuff, you're right, it's still a $4.5 million deficit. The jar is still draining. Unsustainable. Yeah, and unsustainable. I, I think it's just a matter of when. Mr. Ole captured it well uh, when we were talking about some of the increases coming up next year. Not only are we digging our hole, but we've had plenty of help with yeah. the hole being. People the, helping us. We've tried to fill the hole, and while we're trying to fill the hole, the state is coming in and digging the hole yeah. deeper. That's right, because so much of the public spin is about revenue increases or frozen, yep. and nobody looks at the expense side of it, just like we talked about tonight. It's, it's both sides. Any other comments or questions of Linda? Okay, we have a motion on the table. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. You have your mid-year adjustment. And I have a report from the Administrative Services Committee, which is uh, 5.1 on your agenda. Uh, members of the committee, myself, uh, Mrs. Baker and Mrs. Branstad met with Mr. Ellinger and uh, Cindy Young. Uh, the Administrative Service Study Committee reviewed the uh, 1,000 administration as well as the 3,000 professional staff policies, uh, 3110 and 3111. These sections will be presented to the full board of it for adoption at a future Board of Education meeting. Our next uh, meeting uh, is scheduled two weeks away. Two weeks away. I know we didn't meet the ninth, but it's two weeks away, uh, which will at that time we'll review the policies of uh, 3112. And if any of you would like some really uh, exciting reading, um, you can, you're, feel free to join us at those administrative uh, service meetings on our new policies. So, uh, but that's our uh, our administrative service Let report. I escaped that and went to a different committee. <laughs> that was a good move, Dr. Kaminsky. That's full sign, man. Curriculum and instructions. Uh, I don't believe we have a report. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ellison for information. Okay, good evening and thank you. Um, this evening I'm bringing to you a book. It's called Touching Spirit Bear. I'd like to ask you to examine this book along with anyone else who would like to. There will be some copies outside of my office. Uh, we are going to have it available for the 28-D period of evaluation and I'll bring it back for your uh, vote. Uh, with after 28 days. I am bringing this book particularly because it has been selected as a community read book and we would like to make this available at the seventh grade level for our students to participate and this year the community read would be a Great Lakes Bay community read. So others in other communities will also be reading this book and it's a, it's a great book. It's about it, using it to talk about bullying and I would so probably recommend it to you if you haven't read it. I won't tell you anything more about it. Thank you. And you'll bring that back in 28 days. So well. with that, we'll move on to, uh, not that Linda has <laughs> anything better to do, but we're back at finance. So Mr. Oley. Yeah, the FFO minutes of January 30th, and I'm not going to read all the detail because we've already talked about most of this in, in detail, and or we're going to be talking about it in a few minutes. I'll just tell you the areas that we spent our time on talking. And it was not a four-hour meeting this time, so that was good. Um, we reviewed the November and December financial reports. And then we talked in great detail about all the budget adjustments that Linda just went through, both on the revenue side and the expense side. Um, in a few minutes, um, you'll hear Mr. Sabrin uh, talk about the 2012-2015 technology plan, uh, which we reviewed at the FFO meeting. And then uh, one area that I should just take note of and be more coming down the road, and I'm sure our committee will be talking about this as well, uh, Carl led a discussion on the district's long-term financial needs, and the items discussed included the potential renewal of the sinking fund millage, potential of a technology bond millage, and the consideration of a new tech high school concept, which we talked a little bit about. So um, it was a much longer meeting than what I just described. Um, I just don't want to kind of repeat everything that Linda just went through. So that was the FFO meeting. Thank you. And back to Mrs. Klein for gifts. All right. We'll move to the gifts. The first is a donation of items. Eldon D. Anger, who's a local resident and also happens to be an author, donated some of the science books and lab manuals. Hmm that he was the author on, and I believe he worked with Mr. Shadig, our science curriculum specialist on that. Uh, second gift, we are going to have to send back. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a first. Each year, the Midland Area Community Foundation provides the money for the trophies for the annual snow sculpture contest. <laughs> this year, it was postponed, and then it was canceled. 
And so we will be returning their money to them and with thanks for their willingness to fund the contest had it occurred. Uh, they, they do this each year. It's, it's a nice partnership. They're, they're willing to do that. And uh, I'm sure next year we'll have better luck with that. Uh, we also have the Chestnut Hill PTO supporting bus transportation for the fifth grade field trip to Crossroads Village. Uh, so with that, for information, I have $1,310 for you. We'll take off the, the uh, trophies for the snow sculpture contest. A gift that requires your approval is $20,000 from the CB and Anita Branch Trust. And it is to provide two scholarships to the mid top Midland High and Dow High science graduates pursuing a major in science. Well, this came as quite a surprise. Uh, Mrs. Branch contacted me via email. You may know the name. Uh, Mr. Branch was the president uh, and CEO of Dow Chemical back in the early 1970s. And they now live in Texas. But she contacted me about doing this. They support some scholarships at, in their new location in Texas and wanted to do something for the Midland community as well. And so uh, this will be a phenomenal scholarship for those two students. And she did indicate that she it was not need-based and that the selection should be made by committees at the building. So really this will be passed through funds from our district, but will be the, the fiscal agent for these. So I do ask your approval on $20,000. So moved on 722. Moved by Mr. Wasserman, supported by Mr. Oley. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I'm certain there's nobody that opposed, opposing that. So <laughs> we're not even going to ask the question. So with that, we um, move on to human resources. And I know that I have on my agenda that um, Mr. Verlindy is not with us this evening, so I'll defer that to Mrs. Klein. I am now wearing my Mr. Verlindy hat. <laughs> uh, the first is a memoriam. We extend our deepest sympathy, sympathy to the family of Ms. Vanita Birch, passed away on January 27. She worked in the cafeterias at Midland High School, and it at that time, it would have been Central Intermediate School, retiring in 1988. We also have a retirement. D. Paul Steimers, known to most people as Paul Steimers, art teacher at H.H. Dow High School, will be retiring with an effective date of February 16, 2012. Thank you. And now, uh, waiting patiently in the back room, Mr. Sabrin. Um, <coughs> Again, uh, we'll defer this to Mrs. Klein and Mr. Sabrin, as Mr. Valindi is not here this evening, uh, for a technology plan um, piece uh, that is on our agenda for action. Yes, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Sabrin, who is our curriculum specialist for technology, probably better known as the new Norm Near. Oh, no. New and Norm are like, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, that just yeah. totally relaxed me, Linda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I thought everybody needed a, a little bit of a chuckle there. And our technology plan is expiring in June of this year, and Mr. Sabrin has led the efforts to update that plan, and we'll be presenting it to you uh, for your approval this evening. So, Chris, a.k.a. Norm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mrs. Klein. Um, as Mr. Ellinger in invited Mr. Costas this, this evening, I'm very fortunate to be joined by Mr. Dedzik and Mr. Taylor in the back of the room as well, uh, in this case there's any questions that they may need to field for me, and if they're making <laughs> faces behind me. <laughs> they're right there for you. <laughs> they're probably scringing at that norm comment, probably. <laughs> All right. Um, good evening. And um, as Mrs. Klein said, I'm here to share with you a synopsis of the 2012 through 2015 Midland Public Schools technology plan. What I'd like to do this evening is, is share uh, the areas of the plan, uh, highlights of the areas of the plan, and what you'd find if you read the approximately 60-page document. Thankfully, approximately half of that is appendices with um, survey results and scores and so on. Um, about 30 pages of it is, is the narrative components. And it starts out with an executive summary 
Uh, we start off with the mission of the school district, uh, and then we include the demographics. But right off the bat, we share our accomplishments. And in the plan itself, we actually start with accomplishments since 1996. And that is, a, is our starting point of where we started bringing technology in um, into the district. And it talks about our first, our first computer labs, our high-speed network, our first email accounts, the telephones, MPS TV, and so on. But what I have brought to you on the slide this evening is our accomplishments from the last three-year plan from 2009, which I think if you look at this list, it's pretty exciting. Um, we've upgraded our computer labs across the district according to uh, an upgrade schedule. We've recently updated our phone system. Our science labs at the secondary schools have been upgraded uh, with, with wireless coverage and some mobile labs and other science-specific technologies. Uh, we have some wireless coverage across the district in our instructional areas. Uh, we have ceiling-mounted LCD projectors in every classroom. And I need to uh, clarify that statement slightly. And at Adams Elementary School, as part of the Sinking Fund project that's going on this summer, that building will be complete with the ceiling-mounted projectors at that time. We have a document viewer, also known as a document camera, housed in each classroom now. Uh, we have a centralized high-speed storage and archive system in the network. Uh, we also have an off-site disaster recovery location. And uh, we've also started a visualization plan that has decreased energy costs, and that's virtualized servers. As part of the executive summary as well, we also list our, our present inventory. Uh, we have 3,500 computers across the district right now. Uh, we have updated our networking equip equipment, and we also have, of course, the printers and scanners across that you've that you heard about earlier this evening. Um, we also have audience response devices, also known as clickers, handheld recording devices, both audio recording and video recording, and interactive whiteboards. Another accomplishment, though, over the last three years is that in the IMTC, the Instructional Materials and Resource Center, we've actually um, increased our inventory for teachers to check out. So we have more of the audience response devices, more of the video and audio recording devices, and the interactive whiteboards. And I'll talk about professional development shortly. We've had a couple professional development sessions that have allowed teachers to build those in into their teaching and with quite a bit of success. The next portion of the document is the vision portion. And I've lifted the technology uh, vision to share with you tonight. It is the vision of Midland Public Schools that the use of technology becomes part of the educational culture so that students are prepared to reach their post-graduation goals and so teachers, staff, and administrators are able to meet the needs of students today. And I want to lift out the last portion of that statement, meet the needs of students today. Um, that is more than just instructional technology. That is the informational te information systems and information technology working all together to help students reach their goals, helping administrators find the information they, meet, they need, other staff to find information they need. Um, in the end, to close the gaps, and bottom line increase our student achievement. So in the plan, we have the major vision, but then we also have goals that are outlined as well. And I'll share those with you right now. Our goals for staff and students. We have instructional, the instructional side of technology goals, where students are comfortable with technology as well as staff and use that to enhance, enhance the educational experience. Engage in activities that enhance creativity and problem solving. And finally, acquire, evaluate, and use information from a wide variety of sources. Continued, students and staff, for them to have adequate and equitable access to district and outside resources from diverse locations, for them to find and embrace new ways to communicate more effectively, to gather, manipulate, and draw conclusions from data, and use technology safely and ethically. So those are instructional goals that we describe within the plan, but there's also operational side goals. And we describe goals such as staff and students having access to district technology services from diverse locations, communicate easily with others, have timely and consistent technical support, have access to excellent training, provide services efficiently, and receive timely hardware and software upgrades along with increased access. 
as I said before, you know, we're interested in closing the achievement gap and increasing student achievement. So the next part of the plan talks about that integration of technology into the curriculum and student achievement. So we have goals for further goals for staff and students and the technology standards that you see in this slide refers to the student technology standards. These standards help teachers use technology as a tool to achieve their, ins their instructional goals and for our eighth graders our goal is proficiency on the eighth grade technology assessment as defined by No Child Left Behind. Now to help teachers use this technology to increase student achievement we have professional development sessions um, the custom guide is actually uh, 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 a resource we subscribe to that teachers and actually any MPS employee can use for immediate staff development. They just go to the site, it's an online component, they watch a short video and then take that learning immediately away with them. We've had, uh, we have of course our building technology instructional leaders, also known as our building beetles that are in the buildings helping teachers build those, uh, those lessons that integrate technology. We brought teachers in to sessions for Moodle. We've also brought teachers in for discovery streaming and peripheral training such as document cameras, audience response devices, and so on. Part of those uh, professional development sessions, I talk very much about internet safety and ethics. And that's an important part as well of our E-rate funding, which I did an exercise uh, this, this year and uh, made sure we were 100% 100 com 100 compliant with that. Um, and new this year, we started working with our administrators as well on the NETS A, and NETS stands for National Education, Educational Technology Standards, and the A stands for Administrators. And our goal for administrators is that they will learn how to create and sustain a culture that supports digital age learning by becoming more personally comfortable with technology as well as supporting the professional development of staff that they are responsible for. So overall, all of those goals put together uh, when it comes to supporting curriculum integration and student achievement. We're hoping to shift our culture so that teachers and administrators view technology as a tool, not as one more thing, that will increase student achievement and prepare our graduates for success in their future. Technology delivery is actually our chance to brag. It's our chance to share with, um, with our public what we're doing in, our class, in the classrooms and how we're delivering technology to the students. So we have, a, in the document, we actually break out the core areas and the elective areas and share some examples of what's happening. I've shared just a few with you here right now. Probeware in the science classrooms along with gizmos, which are lab simulations. Uh, eBeam interactive whiteboards, and actually there's a young man in that picture right there using one of those in an elementary classroom. Uh, of course, presentation and research. We have computer animated design and graphic design, and document cameras are being used in the classrooms for demonstrations. Some teachers are using them actually to record uh, short videos and pictures and share those out and so on. In fact, one of our power users is act has actually recorded himself with the document camera and leaving that video as part of the sub plans for the next day if he's out of the classroom. An exquisite use, exquisite use of the technology frees up the guest teacher actually to make sure kids are, are learning what they need to. I spoke earlier about professional development and that's another portion of the plan that's very important. Anytime we plan technology professional development, the Michigan Educational Technology Standards and the ISTE nets are ext extensively used. ISTE, the International Society for Technology and Education is really the flagship group and um, they are the ones who've designed the National Educational Technology Standards. And our goal in professional development is to provide sessions for teachers that help them learn how to integrate technology into curriculum they are already teaching, as well as continue to work with teachers on the ISTE NETS T and the administrators on the ISTE NETS A. And you can see A for administrators and T for teachers. And I, I, I don't want any of our teaching colleagues to be afraid of those ISTE nets T because it's not it's not one more thing it's it's helping them understand and better integrate technology into what they're already doing and quite frankly in the PD sessions that we've held with teachers myself and the team of teachers who have helped me out we've snuck in the the teacher standards and I guess sneaky enough that they don't know it that they're learning it 
So it's um, they don't know. It's they yeah they do now <laughs> right exactly. Um, I'd like to think they don't know it. Um, but anyway, giving them the information they need to take back to their classrooms directly aligned with what what uh, ISTE is defining teachers need to be able to do. Okay, the next portion of the document, supporting resources and infrastructure. Um, this section is highlights our policies we have in the district, talks about what video and equipment and electronic resources we have available for any employees of the district. Also discusses uh, the, the actual infrastructure, the, the back room, the data centers and so on, cabling, uh, and the tech support that we have in Midland Public Schools. Our goals that we've highlighted in this area really highlight the infrastructure priorities that we have to upgrade dated computer labs, to upgrade dated teacher computers, um, to, to find a device manage management system for support of computers that are, in, that, are, that are out in the district along with class management support. And what that means is when we have a class of, of students in a computer lab, the teacher at the teacher station is able to lock all the screens or send a message out to everybody to either refocus or enhance the, the instruction and, and so on. Um, increase our wireless capacity across the district, and finally investigate mobile technologies. And I'd like to highlight the mobile technologies because I know that's a, a major um, idea out there right now. We have been working on, on, on researching these mobile devices. Uh, we've, uh, along Mr. Diedzik and Mr. Taylor and myself and some other folks have come together and we're looking into what infrastructure is needed for mobile devices, either at a bring your own technology or bring your own devices, it's also called, um, method, or providing those particular mobile devices, be it iPads or whatever other slate that's out there, or maybe not even that if that's not the mobile device of tomorrow or the next year. Um, we've looked at uh, acceptable use policy implications for staff and for students. Um, we've also looked at what do you do to purchase those apps for any of those devices. Um, also, what are we, how do we support them? How do we make sure they're secure? How do we make sure we're in line with SIPA? And so on. Finally, with this whole technology, how do we, technology plan, how do we monitor it and how do we evaluate it? Um, all of our ta technology staff development sessions are evaluated by teachers at the end of the session. Um, a lot of those reviews have come back quite favorably. We've gone to, um, and actually, as I was compared to Mr. Nor, Mr. Near, Norm Near, <laughs> you can spit it out. Um, just before he moved on to uh, other jobs, we took on a 50-50 idea where we'd instruct for half of the professional development session and then the experts, the teacher leaders, and the curriculum specialists would be in the room to help them design on the spot right there with what they've already learned. And that's helped greatly. It's come back with a lot of positive reviews and a lot of immediate use in the classrooms the next day. Um, our eighth grade technology assessment um, as well is, is out there to assess the student skill level. And finally, there are other surveys that go out to employee groups, um, especially when a help desk ticket is closed, there's a survey that uh, employees are invited to take part in. I would also like to highlight, going back to the eighth grade technology assessment, that in 2008, which is our first year we gave that, we were at 48%. And I'm glad to say that here in 2011, it was reported that 61% of our students were proficient on that assessment. So it's quite a jump. So I think we're moving in the right direction, and I think we can attribute that increase to the work that we've done with our elementary school teachers, and we're seeing that knowledge move its way up the grades. Um, so that's, that's the technology plan. The technology plan for 2012 to 2015. Um, like I said, I, Mr. Diedzik and Mr. Taylor are here, and I want to thank them for being here tonight to as support people in case there's anything I can't answer. So any questions? Andrew. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have one. When you go through all the different technologies that we have, mm -hmm. are there some inconsistencies in some of the schools? Just, I mean, when I see some of those, I think, you know, back from my days on PTO. Oh, sure. That, right. you know, the schools bought a lot of that. Do we have certain schools that are, mm -hmm. have much more than others, or is it pretty well, consistent it, right Well, it depends now? on where you go. And it's actually what you just said with the PTOs. It depends on what the PTO goal was. We have some buildings that their PTO goal was to put wireless in their building before we were ready as a district to actually put that infrastructure in. So you may have one building that has really 
good wireless capacity, but then another building may have had a goal to, say, buy seven interactive whiteboards as far as PTO purchase. So, yes, there are, there are differences that are out there. Um, as far as good, bad, or indifferent, it all depends on what the, the PTO's goals were at that time. Obviously, very appropriately so. This is primarily focused on uh, student development, curriculum development kind of stuff. Um, is there anything in the technology plan that addresses the issue of how do we better, outside of the obvious professional development stuff you've been doing, mm -hmm. how do we better engage, communicate with our, our staff using whether it be social media or other communication vehicles to, you know, bring them closer together relative to administration or Carl's communications out to the staff. That's one question. Is there anything in that area to jack that up a little bit? Or number two, is there anything that will help facilitate improved communication, enhanced communication um, between the district and community, between the district and parents, for example, through all the communication vehicles that are out there? I'm not blogs or email, you know, or right. more sophisticated stuff. Yeah. Anything in the time to yeah. address this, either of those areas? Um, as far as specifically to social media, no. But as far as researching cloud, what happens out in the cloud, all that stuff, social networking, and, and so on, and communication, I think that's part of the goals of the mobile devices and researching, um, researching how to communicate better through those mobile devices because social networking is really applied to those mobile devices. So as far as direct wording, no, and that is something, it's not too late, I can, I can put that in there as far as specifically social networking. Um, but I think the best we've got that's in there right now is the is the mobile device research we're doing because we've been talking a lot about um, policies that are appropriate to the cloud, which then involves you know the Twitter and the Facebook and so on and so forth. Chris, I, I think though part of the answer to your question, Rick, is in the training we do on the National Education Technology Standards for administrators and teachers because some of those standards do allude to how you communicate with your different interested parties. And I, and I think you're slowly beginning to bring some of that up with staff as you work with them in your PD. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. And especially the, the care that you take in communicating as well and you know, the ethical side of that. Any other questions of Chris or anybody? No questions for Mr. Diedzik or Mr. Taylor? Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're, they're back there and available. But the, uh, when, with this plan going into place, it's going to make this work requires people mm -hmm. and people with significant training. And, I mean, anytime we do a technology upgrade in our office, our home, it's usually expensive. And there's a lot of things on that wish list that, you know, we'd like to get. And um, But as time goes on, we're going to be able to formulate what our needs are because uh, I think some school districts have had technology millages because of the uh, the enhancement to the education. It's quite an investment in the school district. So how a year, six months to kind of get our arms around what kind of our wish list would be as far as, uh, you know, the staffing and the support and expenses and things like that. And this is just the start of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess I know part of part of that vision and, and where we want to go, mm -hmm. we'd like to involve the director of technology as well. So as, as far as giving you a, a timeline on that, six months to a year, I know I have my ideas. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. However, bringing in the specialist of the direct, the specialty area of the director of technology, um, I, part of that is we're waiting to, to bring that person in and have some of that conversation. Great. Great. That's a good start, though. Just try to define our needs right. to move the plan forward. So. Really, John, I think what we've discovered um, in the last couple of years is uh, we have probably made too many cutbacks in the area of FTE in all areas of technology from uh, the Beatles and what their jobs used to be like and how they're redefined now mm -hmm. uh, with some cutbacks to uh, how many FTE we have working in the back end and helping with break fix uh, items, uh, project management. I think the, the biggest step that we took that was really astute of us was to hire Plant Moran to uh, really survey the whole district in all areas of technology, including um, IS and business services and so on. And I think there's general agreement amongst all of us that have had lots of technology discussions recently that um, I don't have time as superintendent. Linda didn't have time when she provided oversight for technology 
Mr. Verlindi doesn't have time. Individually, our managers, while they can get out of the box and think beyond their area, they're paid primarily to um, think strategically in the areas they have responsibility for. We need to have somebody here whose full-time job it is to manage all that. Mm -hmm. it, and to not have that person is taking a risk, I think, for the district of getting behind the eight ball mm -hmm. and not being able to use technology in the way that we're beginning to see some other schools can. That's what I'm thinking is as far as being competitive you know, with yeah. other school teachers deciding to come to a district that maybe is more advanced or not. But yeah. I mean, I think the competitiveness would be a big part of that. It's all yeah. very complicated, but I think with proper project management, with priorities from you as a board to me, to the agenda group, to all our technology um, departments that we, or departments that use technology, um, I'm not sure the vision is as clear as it could be, but I think we're getting really, really close to narrowing it down, and the next step is to bring that technology director on. Right? I think the people we have are working really hard, doing the best we can but we're lacking that key ingredient of somebody there at the top to kind of um, have the time that we pay to lead that whole effort. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, You're welcome. Thank you. Very good uh, discussion. Any other questions of Chris? Okay. We, this is an actionable item on your agenda, so we do need a motion. So, so moved. Support. Supported by, or, yeah, moved by Dr. Kaminsky, supported by Mr. Oley. All those in favor of the new technology plan? Signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. You have your approval. Why don't you text Mr. Nearson? We've already forgotten about him. So it's all about you now. I'll take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again, and thank you, gentlemen, for being with us so late in the evening. So um, the next piece on our agenda is the uh, correspondence to and from the board, which uh, is in your agenda. And uh, the next one is our schedule of activities, which lists all of the um, current board meetings through December of this year, uh, along with uh, a couple of special things thrown in there in uh, May. Uh, and it, with that, I will open it up for study discussion with Mr. Wasserman. Um, just one quick comment. It's more generic, but uh, very special tonight with the, the branch donation. Thank you to our donors and community involvement again. We say it all the time, but it really is a differentiator for Midland Public Schools and, and people concerned about our kids and our community's uh, viability and long-term prosperity. It's great. People were here 20, 30 years ago to, to think back and want to keep Midland solid. Uh, I thank the branches and everybody else who does that. Angela. I really don't have much to say. I did, was it last week or a couple weeks ago? I went and visited Mrs. Jacobs' third grade class at Plymouth Elementary. They were the ones that did those um, cards for us oh, that's last nice. time. So I went in, really sweet group of kids. So oh, that was nice enjoyable. Nice. So. And then I have to say, just seeing all the budget stuff is quite a wow. And, <laughs> that, and not a good wow. <laughs> so. Welcome to the board. Yeah, yes. welcome to the board. <laughs> 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 the red numbers. Yeah. Well, I always like to start with some of the things that I've seen too. and. Um, was able to go see Midland High's Quilters uh, play last week when they pr presented it, and I understand that they did very well at regionals and will be heading to states next week, and a lot of awards were given, and th they just do a marvelous job, and of course it's always fun to sit in, in the theater and, and watch these kids uh, perform. Upcoming will be Dow High's Ren Fair before we meet next time, and that's always a, a great experience. Um, and yesterday, the, both high school's POM teams performed at the, and participated in the state competi competitions. So that's a lot of, a lot of work and, and um, always a fun day for them. And as we talk about all the, the budget and all, all the things that we want to do, we need to do, we hope to do, or we can't do, I had lunch with some um, mom friends today, and, and they were all in agreement, as one of them brought up, that we don't always realize, and a lot of people here, as we look at cuts and changes, that we still have such a terrific school system. And so sitting with seven other moms that 100% agreed, I thought I'd like to share that. Because they, they, they hear what's going on, and their kids are affected as well. But we they are still very proud to um, be a part of Midland Public Schools. So, And I think that is a tribute to everyone in this room. and our staff and our community and our families. So, 
on that note, um, I will say happy Valentine's Day right. tomorrow Have and, day. and <laughs> see you in a couple weeks. Thanks, Lynn. Rick. Um, I just want to thank Linda. She always does a nice job in kind of summarizing exactly where we are. And it, as you can tell tonight in my attitude, I get so angry sometimes about the spin that's put, put out in the public or by our, our elected <laughs> officials necessarily that um, maybe don't fully represent exactly what's going on to our financial situation. And, and I hope, um, you know, I'm sure we will through the Midland Daily News and our opportunity to kind of convey these things to the public, not only at meetings like this, but other opportunities we have in the community to say there's a revenue situation, that's what it needs for us but there's also a cost situation. And th that's what stood out to me tonight. And actually, when we talked about this on FFO, this incremental expenses that are imposed on us that you just don't hear people talking about that. You just hear, oh, look, the revenue's gonna be better next year kind of thing. Come on, the, the reality of it is, it's not when you add it all together kind of thing. So I appreciate how you just kind of laid out very clearly for us. And while we have some things to be um, pleased with, I guess, in one time adjustments, um, all you have to do is look at what the projections are for next year. And then we have a lot of work ahead of us in the next few months, an awful lot of work. And it's, it's always depressing. It, ju it just is. And we've proven that we can step up to the challenge, and we've done that for many years now. And you just wonder how much longer we can go without some significant change going on and fundamentally our infrastructure and how we're funded in the state. So en enough of that soapbox. Um, I, too, want to thank the, the Branch Trust. Um, but that's a really generous gift, really generous gift. And um, we're very fortunate. I agree with you, Lynn. Um, when, I, when I was actually thinking about it tonight, when we were talking about the comparison over the last 10 years, and look how devastating these changes have been to us, and yet we're still producing outstanding students with outstanding staff here, and, and we need to do that more often. We need to recognize that, and we're fortunate to have a generous community like the Branch Trust to be able to continue to, to support us. Um, and thanks to Chris for the uh, technology plan, and I think most of us would agree, and certainly we've talked about this in FFO, that this just has to continue to be a priority for us, and I think we agree with you, Carl. I think, you know, through our own doing, all of us kind of think it has taken a step backward a little bit you know, just because of the nature we have to deal with. And I think we have some opportunities to step up to the plate in the next few years. We need to talk more about that relative to technology. So I certainly welcome that. Um, also want to announce um, the Gerstacker Nominating Committee is open for nominations. That's coming up on us. So I take nominations do what we say March 13th. So the Cindy. So please, if anybody has nominations, we've got many, many outstanding staff here and teachers. This is a chance to recognize um, and honor them. So please, if you have uh, people in mind, uh, please get your nominations to us in the next few weeks. And um, one thing, I think we all got this in the mail, and uh, I think it's really, really neat. Uh, I want to say it's called the Booster Bash, the two booster clubs coming together for a big fundraising activity. So I'd encourage all of us and all of the community to really support that joint combined effort. I think it's kind of a, a neat approach, and we certainly uh, continue to need their support down the road. So that's all I got. On to me. Um, also, thanks to Linda being on top of the, the changing economic uh, picture uh, but week by week. And I can't believe you went through that 100 and some pages uh, starting <laughs> on Thursday. I appreciate you doing that. Chris, JT, and everybody else, um, uh, you know, your work on the technology plan, I think it has to be a priority. And it really is something I feel is, um, is going to be extremely important for us getting into the 21st century learning. Um, and also in line with our vision statement and where we need to go and and wanting and feeling the need to keep up with the that pace is just becoming uh, uh, faster and faster all the time um, also to the the donors um, I'm thankful to see the ICT renewed I know that was somewhat questionable it's nice to have uh, that uh, support at the elementary level also the science major scholarship it's nice to encourage uh, those to go into into uh, the science majors and also Dow Chemical for the continued support of the IB uh, is very much appreciated. And I agree with what was said here tonight uh, about some of the cyber schools. I just don't see that with low achievement levels and not the same accountability. It, it I, I just kind of wonder why is it good for us to have certain accountability, certain achievement standards, but because something may cost less or be maybe uh, uh, taken out to, to bid in the business profit uh, centers that um, that, that our legislators should not hear about the cyber schools. Uh, if it's equivalent, it's an equivalent option and it offers some competition and there's some even standards. I, I'm all for that, but I, I'm just really surprised that this type of legislation is considered. I think it'd be worth the public's time to consider. And Ken, I'm probably sure you're going to say something about that in a moment. I usually beat that legislative drum, but I think it's a very good use of our time. And we definitely need to keep up the uh, uh, that uh, awareness of what the decisions are ha are affecting K through 12. Thank you. 
as usual, everything is said before it gets to the end. Um, but I will, uh, again, thank, before I start thanking people and, and, and organizations, I would like to say uh, we, we hope that Yvonne uh, is feeling better. I'm sure she's watching. So a shout out to Yvonne and um, make sure you eat the chicken soup. Um, to Dow Chemical Company Foundation and its commitment to our community with respect to the International Baccalaureate, um, it goes without saying um, we wouldn't be part of what we are without that support. And I think that's a huge, huge thing uh, for our district in, uh, in helping us draw students and providing opportunities for, or for uh, families moving to our community from the international uh, um, job market, uh, whether, regardless of where they come from in, in, in the global uh, economy and how they land uh, in, Mid in Midland uh, working for any number of companies that uh, support this community. So uh, big shout out to them. Uh, also to MyTech for their willingness to provide this financial support to send a team down to Pickney and I think that's huge uh, as we uh, have uh, sort of taken a, a step in the direction of focusing on what a new tech high school program might look like for Midland Public. Another critical piece in, in, in exploring that opportunity. So a uh, thank you to my tech. Thank you to Betty uh, for her information this evening. Um, and I generally try to stay on top of that kind of thing uh, when it regards to behaviors in young people. And um, but that's, a, that you, that's a new one for me. And so I, I'm glad that you were able to share that with us. And I'm certainly certain that some of us will uh, uh, take the opportunity to uh, look at that, uh, that information. Uh, to the Midland High Chemics who just left um, that were here this evening, uh, you, you endured a long, long meeting. But to um, to our teachers for a uh, uh, what was a uh, I'm convinced a very successful exam period that they all of our students just got through, and I don't think that um, uh, we give enough credit uh, to the teachers with respect to uh, preparing our students for that period of time and 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 and, and uh, helping with the success that our students have. To Linda and Chris uh, and to the team back here, what uh, great, great presentations this evening, uh, not only to the board but to our public with respect to uh, what we are up against um, from the financial side and, and what we need to do to improve our technology offerings for our district. So um, it was a great meeting and uh, I thank all of you for your contribution and comments and for, with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Ellinger. Uh, two th well, really just one thing in terms of an announcement. Um, I think Dr. Kaminsky is the only board member that's had an opportunity to visit a new tech program, if I'm not mistaken. And John, you made the trip to California, was it? Or to, yeah, California. Okay, California Pickney. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sore butt on the airplane. <laughs> the difference. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, 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 Carl. Well, while I'm really pleased that we have a chance to broaden out and take our high school staff, a because now is the time right. to do that, and, and we'll do that later this week. But I think there'll be an opportunity for three of you board members to accompany us if you can afford to get away from work uh, for a couple of days to visit a new tech um, high school down in the suburbs of Dallas and then um, also a more technical STEM type high school and with some other community members as we continue to explore what this would mean and where we might find some funding to help pull a program like this off. So if you are interested, um, would you please let Ken or I know so we can begin seeing um, who that would be and we'll try to build a trip around uh, the, right. s the schedule of those of you that might be interested. I think it's really critical that uh, we get three board members to go on that trip. So having said that, I'm pleased to announce that uh, Governor Rick Snyder has proclaimed this week, February 13th through the 17th, as Michigan School Principals Week. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of our building principals and assistant principals, assuming you're still watching, um, for your professionalism, dedication, and enthusiasm for staff, students, and families in all 12 of our buildings. And each of those principals or assistant principals got a uh, personal note from me this past weekend in the mail. So thanking them for those efforts. They're well-deserved, and they do a tremendous amount of work on behalf of uh, the staff and the students they serve. So heartfelt thanks for uh, continuing to do that. Uh, Chemic salutes, congratulations to Katie Smith, uh, Nick Kaufman, 
Becca Bonecamp, Justin Miller, Brandon Smith, Tyler Scott, Hunter Wilson, and Chris Smith. They're all DECA members who qualified for the state DECA conference, so that's pretty incredible. I'm sure some of them will be headed off to a national conference. Also, Midland High, special congratulations goes out to, is it Newt Hoffman? Is yeah. that how you pronounce mm -hmm. it? For being selected uh, this month's ESPN uh, Scholar Athlete as well as the Saginaw Valley League Wrestler um, Wrestling MVP Award winner. Newt has had 21 wins and only two losses, um, doing a great job. So we're all proud of him. His father's pretty happy, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine he would be. Um, Lynn had mentioned congratulations to the uh, respective uh, POM teams. Uh, we had a note turned in from Dow High. Their varsity and JV POM, POM teams competed in the Mid-American uh, Mid POM POM Regional Competition on Saturday, January 28th. Both teams received scores in the highest performance bracket, advancing them to the Class A Division I state championship. So uh, compared to where that program was a few years ago, that is tremendous growth of that program across town. Midland High, congratulations to the Midland High Coral students that participated in this year's District Solo and Ensemble Festival at CMU on Saturday, February 4th. Midland High had an outstanding showing with almost all events uh, being selected to move on to the state level. Both the men's and women's ensembles of MHS received superior ratings as well as several other small groups and soloists. So congratulations to um, all of them. And then Jefferson Middle School on the same day, 50 of their choir students performed at the same district solo and ensemble festival of CMU. It was a great day for the uh, Jefferson Husky singers. Congratulations to them. And then again, just a uh, shout out to the quilters. Um, on their first place finish Saturday, January 28th, the One Act District Theater Festival. The production then competed in the regional competition held in Holland this past Saturday where they did indeed qualify for state. So pretty amazing what our kids continue to do. Um, thank goodness they don't get sidetracked by <laughs> the issues that uh, we get confronted with uh, all too often this time of year and between now and June. But uh, you know what, sometimes even those of us that work in that end of the business, you look to what's happening that's just filled with accomplishments on behalf of our kid and it makes you feel about the, the good about the job that you do. And I hope all six of you and, and Mrs. Gordon feel likewise as board members. You should be proud of the district that you're associated with as well. Absolutely. That's it, Mr. President. With that, I have one other announcement. And I know I don't work there anymore, but the Midland Area Community Foundation is currently in the scholarship mode for those high school seniors and those college students that are may or may not be listening this evening. Um, scholarships are currently open, uh, I believe, until the first week in March. So. Uh, if you know of uh, students or you have students that uh, are interested in applying, uh, I know that they have over 100 uh, scholarships that they offer to our community for high school, area high school and, and college students. So I had to give them a kudo, uh, even though I'm no longer a staff member there. And with that, if there's not anything else for the go to the order, we will stand adjourned at 912.